Alright, alright. Hello, hello to all. I'm here today in the Tier 8 Japanese Tech Tree Carrier, the Shokaku. We are here on the map Mountain Range, and the mode is Domination. Doing a bit of cooling off, doing a bit of trolling in other surface ships, so I thought I'd hop into my favorite Tier 8 Carrier and kind of pull things back a little bit. We're up against an Augustus von Percival. Parcival. And in the tier 10 matchmaking, we have Kremlin Georgia as the only battleship. It's pretty rare. You can see I'm fully flag stacked. We're looking to get the Karyu in a short period of time. If fingers crossed things go well, maybe we can do it here. So, enemy has Kremlin Georgia, both pretty durable battleships. And then Hindenburg Petro Rune Cleveland Arp Takao, which is a Atago. So, pretty good AA, pretty good AA. Uh, pretty decent AA, pretty poor AA, and then Z52, Oscar Golden and Lightning, Akazuki. Oscar can be a bit annoying for tier 8 carrier aircraft, but it's not nearly as annoying as a Holland in terms of DPS, so uh, while I would normally pre-drop in that kind of case while I'm doing my initial scouting screen, especially versus Holland in tier 8 carriers, I will pre-drop because if you bump into the Holland by accident, he will absolutely annihilate your squadron if he has his AA off and he jumps you. Uh, versus the Oscar Gauntlet, on the other hand, not so worried. Scouting out for the central DD for the Kitakaze, and it is in fact this destroyer division. Now versus this kind of division, I'm going to favor damaging the Akazuki. One, he's not turning. Two, the lightning has lots more smokes. And thirdly, he's much larger of a surface area. I overshot him by a little bit, still managed to land 11 rockets. The Shokaku rockets are often said to be worse than the Lexingtons, and they are, especially when there were only two carrier lines in the game. However, they're still extremely potent anti-destroyer tools. As you can see, I'm putting a total of 20 rockets into him for 11,000 damage. His reluctance... okay, apparently it's only 18 rockets. His reluctance there to smoke and pay respects when he has his destroyer diffmate there before he's in the cap kind of getting him quite punished. Shokaku rockets only have 28 millimeters of penetration, but each plane fires off six rockets, so you're dumping 18 rockets per plane. Neither of those destroyers smoked, so I'm going to go and force smoke. I have a Kitakaze and a Drake of all things here, so if they get hit by Drake AP, I imagine they're not going to be very happy. I don't have concealment expert on this particular Shokaku captain yet, so my concealment is 7.5 as opposed to 6.75, but that's still fairly minimal reaction time. Diving into the last known locations, there's that lightning, gonna pop a fighter, but my goal here is the Akazuki, who's already wounded. Popping a heal, they do manage to trim one of my carrier torpedo bombers. I'm gonna use my allied tracers to try and get in on this target. Oscar Gauntlet pops up, popping my engine cooling here. It's under fire. Probably gonna turn out though, so not a great angle for me in particular. Clip some lightning flak, but you can see with the AA off on these ships. Very happy to stay on them. 3,800 because this hull is pretty saturated by high explosive damage already. Destroyers don't really take torpedo damage the same way as other ships, so even though my torpedo is supposed to have 7,000 odd alpha, they don't take 7,000 damage. Now that lightning smoke is going to fade, my torpedo does clip the Ostergalden on the bow, and I am going to take him out. I saw that lightning pop up with the faded smoke there, so I'm just going to pop my engine cooling on my rockets to get to that lightning as soon as possible. You can see me here in this bottom tier game bullying the destroyers as hard as possible, especially if they're going to present themselves up to me on a silver platter by charging into the cap in the beginning of the game. In a carrier game like this, unless you're willing to commit your smokes quite aggressively as that lightning could have, you really cannot afford to dive in like that. Agazuki need was forced to commit his smoke quite early. He chose not to commit his smoke, and as a result he took 11,000 damage, which he cannot heal. So, not exactly a great exchange for him. Getting, cutting through on the lightning's path to see if he cut across into that cap. He might have dove down, however. I'm checking Akazuki as well. There's apparently a fighter here. Didn't quite find him. The lightning is going to have his smoke back by now. 
I'm gonna sweep again. The lightning has an extremely small air surface or air spot radius. And oh, he's actually in the cap. I can see this because my Kitakaze is actually blocked. So either him or the Akazuki are in the cap. I'm gonna check the Akazuki's position first. Blind prepping. Do force another smoke. So this guy got to frivolously use his smokes. Petro Pavlosk puts up eight puffs of flak, which is extremely potent. Still not able to find that lightning, however. Petro instantly kills the fighter I dropped, so it was a bit of a pointless fighter. But at least he knows where the Akazuki is, roughly. Still taking my time now, I could attack that Cleveland. I'm gonna move my hull back towards C because that's the side we're securing. And I know he's left the cap now because the cap is now ticking. There's that lightning, and up further is the Akazuki. I'll light him up for the Kitakaze. Continuing the bully. And there's a Kremlin in my face. Don't like that. Okay, I have no idea how he managed to push that far. Obviously, I should have been paying more attention. I do have my heal up, so I can contest the Kremlin. Okay, Hull, I need you to turn right fucking now. <laughs> the Kremlin w can and will punch holes into me, so... Let's see if I can force him to slow down and not in beach. I really do not want to get shot. Okay, I'm, I'm getting shot. <laughs> but we were expecting that. Okay, I'm very lucky. To not take more damage. Kremlin has some poor dispersion, I guess. For once, I did break his engine, but looks like he just DCP'd immediately. So maybe I can score a flood. You can see Kremlin actually has fairly good AA, but even on his own, because I had that heal consumable already, I was able to tank for quite a bit. My hull still spotted that detectability icon telling you that. Try and avoid that torpedo ball. She fired again. Looks like it wasn't at me though, based on the fact that I didn't take large sums of damage. My hull is on the run. Do score a flood, but with that Russian damage control, I cannot guarantee that that flood's gonna stick. I'm gonna deal with this Kremlin in the meantime, pulling my torpedo bombers again, not confident that I can punch through his vertical protection. Lightning does get eliminated by my Holland and Z23 combination. Kremlin does of course put up 8 puffs of flex, so fairly potent. Looks like he DCP'd and then set fire. Or, I don't know, actually he's still flooding, I just cannot tell with the visual indicator of the damage control party. This Kremlin kind of showing off why you cannot solo monkey push, even as a very powerful battleship like the Kremlin. He will get focused down. Looks like he's considering not pushing anymore. Nope, he's committed. He's reversing, breaking his engine here. Making full use of my squadrons, and you can see even very heavy AA. If you're gonna monkey push, well, you're gonna get punished. Now, I haven't made use of the die bombers that much. Do manage to rescore Flood, which will hopefully be lethal. He does not appear to have a Kuznetsov, and you can see very quickly racking up the damage. That was quite frightening for a moment, however. The dive bombers, which I haven't used at all, have 6200 alpha. This is after all the nerfs. They used to have around... Whew, I want to say... 7000 flat to 6800 or so alpha. I'm gonna attack this Petro Pavlovsk. They have fairly good penetration. You can penetrate even things like a Montana, which has fairly good vertical protection. Although it is a little inconsistent, it really depends on how much superstructure you have to go through. The dive bombers are slightly faster than the torpedo bombers, accelerating to 183 knots with this particular build. The 3x3 setup is excellent. Now I could go after the Takao, but the Petro Pavlovsk, while being thornier, is a little more alone. You can see his 8 puffs of flak putting up an impressive wall for me to fly through. 
managing to trim my planes. I'm gonna just drop while well, I still have three aircraft to ensure maximum hits, but the inaccuracy at that altitude does mean that I do lose out on a little bit. Now my team is monkey pushing through, chasing a Hindenburg, but a Des Moines and a Montana can hopefully do it. So I'm gonna push back toward the enemy team with my hull, which is fairly stealthy. You can see 12 kilometers. It goes down to 10.7 at max. But I don't have concealment expert on this captain yet. It would be much easier for me to bully this Takao, but the Petropavlovsk is the threat, and I do have another heal symbol up. The Petropavlovsk's const constant AA is not particularly high, it's really just about that flak wall that it puts up at 6.6 kilometers. I'm gonna use the mountain to shield me and engage at about 6.1, so preventing myself from taking maybe about a tick or two of damage. He still does about 30 knots. These torpedoes do 53 with this build. 50 base, and then I have the module. Pretty good flood chance on Japanese torpedoes. Combined AA of the Takao and Flag, or Petro. From the close range of those angry red puffs, I can tell it's a def AA from the Atago, which means, well, I don't really care. Atago AA is terrible. Landing hits on the stern repeatedly, broke his steering gear now. Holding back on that boost bar, but I don't really have that much boost left didn't have last stand on his captain, so not going to be able to do too much to him. But his steering gear is broken, so he's pretty much committed to a straight line, so with that flood as well, he's going to drop quite easily. Shokaku showing off for power and prowess. They have failed to kill that Hindenburg so far, and this is why you don't chase kiting ships. But now hopefully I can help them out. I'm pushing slowly toward the cap. Do note that we have a, still have a slight point lead from holding the cap advantage for a small amount of time. Thankfully, my Des Moines does eliminate the Hindenburg. Okay, Tako moving quite slowly. So I'm gonna twist during the actual drop. Versus a cruiser, I don't have to drop at particularly high altitude, so I can drop lower to get increased accuracy. Deuce managed to score one Citadel. And I'm gonna incidentally light up the Z-52. This Tako is in a fairly tricky position. If he had it, I probably would have smoked for him as Z-52 if I felt concerned for his life. I'm gonna drop a bit early. Okay, the bombs are gonna swing a little bit wide. Probably should have waited a couple of seconds. Probably could have picked up that kill myself. I'm gonna chase now the Parzival and the Z-52. Now the Parzival has pushed up quite aggressively, which is usually a decent thing to do, but in this case it's gonna get him spotted and killed. My Des Moines and Luyang are closing quite aggressively. And you can see even me with my 34 notch Shokaku Hall, he able to maneuver around the map quite well. Now I did end up getting not punished by that Kremlin, he probably should put at least 20k into me. This fighter's gonna get eliminated before it can lock onto me, so not too concerned about that. It's gonna screen for the Z-52. Whoa, okay. Engine boosting here, just so I can squeeze off these torpedoes. I'm gonna lead slightly. You can see I put the reticle over the point where he is, because I'm expecting him to turn outward, and this makes it much, much trickier. Okay, the fighter does latch onto me. I'm gonna wait for it to start dealing damage. I'm gonna try and heal through much of its damage. You can see me using that heal as a bit of a shield to keep my planes from taking damage too much. Z-52 has pretty good A, but he's going to lose spotting with the loss of the fighter, and my torpedo is enough to clean up that kill. Obviously, he did take quite a bit of damage from my allies. This damage squadron is no longer useful. Really didn't make use of the APDBs here. Would have been nice to score that one kill with the uh, on the Takao, but I did end up dropping a little higher. So from higher altitude, you can see, versus cruisers, it is quite risky. So a heavy, heavily armored cruiser like the Petro Pavlos, which does require that you drop from a greater height, can decrease your accuracy quite a bit. But overall, the Shokaku in this kind of matchmaking, especially when those destroyers decide to push aggressively, showing off that it's really no slouch, fully expecting to finish high on this leaderboard. Especially with all that destroyer damage. Now obviously the Parsible is somewhere in that top corner. We've regained the lead quite substantially, thankfully, that Hindenburg didn't, did end up losing to that uh, Des Moines 
Montana pairing. He amazingly managed to burn one of them down before he died. But the Des Moines managed to stay quite healthy, and the Des Moines has fairly potent heal. Okay, I should have pre-dropped here, by the way. Because there's really no point committing this many aircraft. You can see that self-defense fighter, so his AA is going to trim some of my planes on the way in. And then what's left, it's going to get eaten up by that defense fighter. He's fully unsaturated here, by the way, so you will see a full 18 rocket hit for 13,000 damage as I score my confederate. Drop that fighter to keep him lit up, by the way, although this Drake and Lo Yang pushing the corner does mean that he is gonna die and get spotted anyway, so that fighter not necessarily uh, needed. My team is making quick work of him. I actually highly doubt I'm actually gonna get a strike off. I don't have any more boosts on my torpedo bombers, which I used very extensively this match. 20 torpedo hits, as you can see. But I would aim right about here. And drop right about there and ho have him hopefully sail into probably just one, but maybe two torpedoes if I was lucky. Because he's coming toward me, I do have to leave a bit of a space so he doesn't short torpedoes. And I did mention that I did flag stack. I'm fairly confident on this ship, so pretty happy with the results. Confederate and First Blood for with 146,000 damage, 20 torpedoes, 3 bomb hits, as I mentioned. Did not use the bombers at all, didn't have any particularly relevant targets other than the Takao and Petropavlovsk, and the bomb that hit the Petropavlovsk happened to bounce off the deck, so what can you do? 5 incapacitations, 2 kills, 6 floods. Only one Citadel, one assisted capture, 10 spotting ribbons, and 45 rocket hits. Rockets, of course, proving themselves to be quite useful as anti-destroyer armaments, and as I mentioned, a nice 2300 base experience to easily top the leaderboard in this tier 10 game, in the tier 8 carrier. Shukaku, of course, always excellent. That experience, of course, coming from all this destroyer damage, 4k here, 11k here, that's all rocket damage, by the way. So. Don't let anyone tell you that the Shokaku rockets are not good. They are excellent when used in their intended role for anti-light target duties. Now, light target can be a very broad term. It can vary from anything from cruisers of lower tier, that which have less than 28 millimeters of, pen of armor, or destroyers, or even just battleship superstructure. 70,000 into that lone Kremlin pushing up of which 50,000 is Torpedo Alpha, and keep in mind the Kremlin does have a Torpedo Bulge rating of around 50%, the second highest in the game, I believe, behind the Yamato. So, fairly substantial bulge. 30,000 into the Petropavlovsk, again leading on Torpedo Alpha, 89,000 Torpedo Alpha overall, making the bulk of our damage in this particular match. Bombs are extremely powerful, but if you don't have a relevant target for them, such as a Cruiser. In this particular lineup, they are good against the Taco, th or Takao, sorry, the Hindenburg, Petropavlovsk, Rune, Cl and Cl actually, you can actually use them against basically all the cruisers, but there's only two battleships here. And most of the cruisers ended up being quite out of my range until, well, other stuff happened to them. Really, the, the Taco was, and the one strike on the Petropavlovsk were the only opportunities I had to make that attack. Oh, there's an Alaska loss. <laughs> As I said, I have been doing a bit of trolling, making taking use of that 100% first win, however, to get my Shokaku nicely kitted out. Approaching the Hikaryu, obviously. But anyway, this is on my alt, so I do not have a 19 point captain, but a fairly standard Shokaku build. So this is my preferred current Shokaku spec. First year modules, Airgris mod 1, Aircraft Engines mod 1, and then Torpedo Speed. Now if you're running Torpedo Acceleration, you don't really want to take this Torpedo Speed module, as I've mentioned on other reviews of Japanese carriers. And instead, you'd probably take Torpedo Bomber Aiming Time. But currently, I'm freeing up Captain Points here and taking the module here. Now usually, for any carrier with a heal on the Torpedo Bomber, so that's basically every Tier 8 carrier, upward, other than the Fred, uh, sorry, not Frederick, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, you take bomber health because the torpedo bombers have the heal, and so you can use the heal as pseudo health when you're attacking heavy AA targets. And putting on health will help you get through some of those uh, heavy AA bits. 
you can see that 2000 HP versus the 1850 on the bombers because of that 7.5% health. Uh, however, because I personally lean on the torpedo bombers quite a bit, kind of building a proficiency in hitting destroyers with torpedoes, as you saw from that Ostrogothan kill pretty early in the match. Uh, because I use the torpedo bombers so much on this particular ship, as well as, say, the premium counterpart, the Kaga, I actually end up putting the HP on my torpedo bombers. I find the 1850 to be quite sufficient for the cases where you should be reaching for them, where it's like, the torpedoes are kind of your catch-all, so you're going to use them to attack any kind of target, and then the bombers I save for targets that are kind of alone, or just uh, ideally suited for proper AP dive bomber attacks rather than something I'm forcing through. So I just put the extra HP on the torpedo bombers because I just lean on them so very much. You don't have to, the, the dive bombers are extremely powerful, especially when they're in their applicable use cases, but that's just how I'm choosing to spec it out. So there's no real wrong choice here as long as you don't put the HP on the rocket planes. The rocket planes, while being quite usable, are not particularly impressive. So between bomber health and torpedo bomber health, pick, take your pick. And last but not least, servicing time. The Shokaku actually has quite a few aircraft on deck already. You can see it goes to 16, 17, and 16. So it'd be 14, 15, 14 without it. But the extra concealment doesn't really help that much. And when you're bottom tier like this, having those extra two aircraft at the beginning of the match can definitely help you conserve your reserves. The rockets, as I mentioned, are not particularly special. Six rockets per plane with 2200 alpha and 28 millimeters of penetration. Fire chance is 9% without any flags or anything. Actually, I think I'm actually flagged up, so it's probably 7%. Yeah, I did, I did flag up in order to take advantage of that full flag stack and get that 30k experience. So it's 7% fire chance. Let's go back to my standard grind spec. This is, by the way, the standard setup I use when I'm grinding a line. Not that flag stack, but what I'm about to put here. Now, because I'm using a pretty strong camo in Stars and Stripes, I'm putting on that free experience flag, but uh, normally I wouldn't even have the free experience flag on, and I'd be using a camo kind of like this Autobot arc, a 100-100 experience flag, or, or ex experience camo, sorry, or anything with like, about plus 100 base experience, like Battle Hardens or something. The other stats don't really matter that much really after just the hull experience when I'm grinding a line, obviously. Captain Wise, as I mentioned, not a fully kitted out captain, but this is my current priority IGN captain build. So, the modified Core 9, because I'm taking that torpedo speed on already fast torpedoes, the torpedo bombers have 50 knot base torpedoes. I'm taking the modified plane speed Core 9, so air supremacy into plane speed, into armor, and survivability expert. Follow this up with, in this case, site stabilization, just to make sure that those dive bombers aim as fast as possible. Now the practical difference in aiming time is about 0.5 to 0.75 seconds, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're attacking a maneuvering target, getting that reticle nice and narrow to the maximum accuracy, that 0.75 seconds earlier is actually an a significant amount. Excuse me, sorry. So, since especially since your munitions are not HE munitions, like found on the Lexington, for example, uh, and you care about where your bombs are placed, getting them at that precise moment is actually extremely important. So I'm at 16 points. At 17 points, I'm going to go for Concealment Expert, bring that hull concealment down to the 10.7. 12 is already pretty respectable and the 7.5 on the torpedo bombers is also pretty good, but taking Concealment Expert cuts this down to 6.75 and 10.7, which allows you to operate a little more aggressively and gives you a little less reaction time on your torpedo bombers, which are already great and makes them even better. Uh, in particular, something you can do with IGN torpedo bombers is because their concealment or detectability rating is so low, you can use them to sweep for destroyers. Normally, with that 10, to 10 or 9 kilometer detection radius, most planes sweeping for destroyers have to do fairly large circles. You kind of have to do a fair bit of guesswork as to where the destroyer is. But with a nice tight detection circle like 6.75 kilometers on these torpedo bombers on both the Shokaku and later on the Akaryu, 
you can make quite a tight sweep, and given that most destroyers at high tier have between 1.8 to 2.8 air detectability, you can find them within fairly short order. Uh, after Consumant Expert, that Consumant's going to put me to 17, as you can see quite readily. And you just follow up with a fairly standard improved engine and last gasp. Uh, probably actually last gasp first is my preference before improved engine boost. Now with the large squadron size of that 2x5 torpedo bomber squadron on the Shokaku, you can get a fairly hard time to get use out of your last gasp, but with the 3x3 bombers and 3x3 rocket planes, it ends up being quite useful. The torpedoes, by the way, have 7200 alpha and you drop two of them, and with the current, uh, shall we say, slightly malformed iteration of torpedo dispersion, where sometimes you can get ultra narrow spreads if you get the maximally aimed torpedoes. Uh, these extremely potent torpedoes are very difficult to dodge. Now the arming distance on Japanese torpedoes is very long, so you have to be you have to be very aware of people shorting your torpedoes, especially right now I think there's a bug where the reticle doesn't actually accurately display where your torpedoes uh, will s not have enough room to arm, they actually need a little bit more space than it's even indicated right now on occasion because of some visual, visual or reticle bug indicator, I don't know. They've been messing around with the carrier interface a little bit on the past few patches, so sometimes it's a bit difficult. But overall, uh, by far your most powerful squadron, especially if you can perfect the aiming. It's kind of like using those fast German torpedoes on the new German carriers, but these ones hit <laughs> nearly um, nearly twice as hard per torpedo. So they do end up having a lot more overall flexibility. The German torpedoes are good. They can damage basically any kind of target, but it's really going to be pseudo-chip damage, but the Japanese torpedo really ends up being a true alpha weapon that you can rely on to kill targets, even versus a saturated destroyer like that Ospigal, and I ended up getting that 3800 chunk off of him. <laughs> Not a great morning session, by the way, which is why I switched over and played a game of Shokaku to kind of get it out of my system. But yeah, you can see me putting 9,000 damage into him with two torpedoes. It's just not something you can do with German torpedoes. You would have to put probably three or four torpedoes into him before you could reach that kind of damage output. Death by torpedo, death by torpedo. This guy's all rockets. This guy's bomb. Don't remember this. Okay, this guy died by rockets as well. But yeah. Nothing to say here, you've seen me play Shokaku before, you should know if you're following this channel for a while that I love this ship. I th so out of the tech tree tier 8s, I think Shokaku's... It's, it's definitely tied with the Lexington. So the Lexington is a little more flexible thanks to its HE armaments, which allow it to attack targets more flexibly. And so if you don't, like, you saw that last match I didn't even use my bombers because I didn't have any real targets for it. That never happens to the Lexington. There's always going to be something you can hit with your, with all of your squadrons, pretty much, thanks to the fact that it uses HE munitions. So both of these carriers are extremely strong. Now, right underneath the top premiums, so you have kind of like Enterprise and then Shokaku Lexington. Shokaku Lexington as top dogs, especially if you consider if you factor in use like ease of use and flexibility, and then I would rate ships like Parsifal, which is extremely strong, especially when it's top tier, but is much uh, less well performing as a bottom tier carrier compared to the Shokaku. It's kind of like a super specialized version of the Shokaku, and specialization isn't always the greatest thing in this game. Uh, the MVR above it actually ends up being more of a jack of all trades because its ships, or sorry, its planes are way too strong. But that's a complete aside. But the Parsifal at tier 8, which gets access to those triple torps, the Wesser is crap, by the way, it's a piece of trash. The Parsifal, uh, you finally get enough munition density to feel good about yourself, moving from twin torpedoes to triple torpedoes and twin bombs to triple bombs, so it's a fairly good carrier, but it's a little over specialized and really lacks. The flexibility of the Shokaku, so at tier 8 the Shokaku far out 
outshines it, whereas the MVR at tier 10 is kind of even with the Karyu, if not better, in the current metagame. Uh, and then sadly for the implacable, it's the definitely on the bottom rung of the <laughs> tech tree carriers, and toward the bottom, still better than the uh, Grav Zeppelin, which suffers from a lot of problems, but not that far above it. Carriers like the Kaga, I would rate at the same tier. The Kaga is about the same tier as the Parsable. This is a very brief version of this, by the way. I'm just going over it just for thrownness, but we'll probably be covering this in a full video at some point. The Kaga I would rate about the same as the Parsable, so just underneath the Shokaku and Lexington, which are both, of course, just underneath the Enterprise. So Kaga is the best premium, and then Saipan and Indomitable. Am I missing anyone? I think that's all of them. Saipan and Indomitable I would rate about the same. Saipan is pretty good, she has tier 10 squadrons, but she does suffer from having a pretty weak hull. Her reserves are very vulnerable to getting her deplaned. Uh, and she can be pretty swingy in terms of matchmaking as well. When she's top tier, she is a monster. Her planes are basically immortal, but when she's bottom tier, because she has such low reserves, even though she has tier 10 planes, it doesn't really compensate for the fact that the AA gets way stronger at tier 10, so you end up losing more than two-ish aircraft in a lot of attacks if you make the wrong decision and attack a pack that's too heavy, so with her two minute plus reserve, uh, regeneration time, that really doesn't pan out very well for her. And then the Indomitable is extremely powerful, it's the only carrier that can slingshot that's left in the game, but uh, it's only able to really set fires and pen 32mm of armor, which ends up being a problem, but the fact that it can slingshot in and of itself and basically attack any target with impunity if you do it properly and permanently set something on fire is uh, an extremely powerful ability, but that specialization does ultimately put her below all of the more flexible carriers such as Kaga, Parsifal, and then above them Lexington, Shokaku, and Enterprise, so she's kind of in that Saipan tier. Right below the Saipan is the Implacable, and then below that is the Grav Zeppelin, and that's the tier 8 carrier lineup, so... What you're looking at here, the Shokaku that you just saw played, is probably for me the second best carrier at tier 8, tied with the Lexington. Anyhow, uh, we've gone a bit off on a tangent, but pretty nice thorough game, and a pretty solid experience, so I'm happy with that. On this account, we're getting pretty close to unlocking the Hakaryu at 35.5. Uh, I actually finished with the Parzival already, just recently, so we've moved on to the Richthofen, which we're going to be getting out, so it's probably going to be all for now.